I'm going to go start from the outside in, and I'm going to start with a young man, uh, one of my one of my tall mentor sons. Uh, he's my big little brother. Uh, I've known uh, Chris for a number of years. Uh, his organization, um, the Community uh, Center for Court Innovation, came out of the fund for the City of New York. I was there when uh, your organization, where you are now, was an abandoned building, and they took me on the tour, and I was wondering, oh my goodness, what are they going to do with this building? It wasn't even a white elephant, it was a dead elephant. Uh, but it was brought back to life. And I think in the spirit of uh, finding a way forward, I think it's fitting that you open us up. Please, your name again and the organization title, and then jump in it, and then we'll just move like that. Sure. Is that all right? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, good, still good morning, uh, everyone. It's a real honor to be here. Uh, we have partnered with the Interface Center um, and, and other partners who are in this room to kind of bring this collaboration involving the faith community. Is your mic on? Pull it close. How's that? Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. 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 Um, I, so I'm acknowledging our partnership uh, with Harlem congregations that I think is absolutely invaluable to the work that we're doing with uh, men and women who are, are coming home. My name is Chris Watler, as, as the Reverend said. Uh, I'm the project director for the Harlem Community Justice Center. Uh, so I work for an organization, we do justice reform work, but our approach is uh, a little unique. We function as a kind of technical assistance arm to the state court system, helping the state court system uh, to develop drug courts and a whole range of other problem-solving courts. But one of the projects are community courts, and I run uh, one of the community courts here in Harlem. Uh, it's a unique place. As the Reverend said, we kind of breathe life into it. It opened uh, in 2000. It's an old magistrate's court that was built in 1891. It was the fifth district police precinct in jail, uh, back when the city had magistrate's courts in communities. And the whole idea was to really bring the courts, court system back into neighborhoods as a problem-solving entity, so not just as a way to process cases, but how can we solve problems? And before we opened, we spent some time talking to the community about its priorities what it felt were issues in the neighborhood that needed uh, a solutions. And three things emerged. Housing, uh, so we have a housing court and a housing help center, and we do a lot of work to prevent eviction uh, in, uh, in Harlem, in our catchment area. Uh, juvenile delinquency was another issue. Uh, people in the community were really concerned about young people uh, who were getting in trouble with the law. So we have a small family court part uh, where we do juvenile delinquency cases, but I also have social workers in my building that work alongside uh, the probation officers and the lawyers to make sure that young people have as many off ramps as possible. Uh, but even if a young person is referred to court, they can be monitored in the community by the judge and, and have confidence that they're getting services connected to services that they need and that we're working with the family. And the last bucket that I'll mention is uh, reentry. We are the only community court in the world, and I can say that now because we have helped to propagate community courts in Australia, in England, in South Africa. We're the only community court in the world that deals with uh, inmates, men and women who are coming back from state uh, prison, and we do that in uh, in three ways. One is we run what's called the Harlem Parole Reentry Court. It's a partnership with the State Parole Agency. It's an attempt to do community-based supervision and uh, support for men, uh, mostly men, vast majority of men and women who are coming uh, back home. Uh, that program has been in operation since 2001. We've served over 1,200 uh, high, mostly high and moderate risk. These are individuals who are at risk of reoffending and returning uh, 
uh, to the community. Uh, and we do in that work uh, a lot of work with our men and women to address what's called criminal thinking, right? Um, and that's very important for ult the ultimate success of our clients in parole. Our goal is to get them immediately when they come out and to help them survive the first nine months of parole and hopefully stabilize them in the community. Rapid access to housing, employment, uh, a range of other services that they, that they need. As part of our reentry work, we also convene the Manhattan Reentry Task Force, which is a partnership with the State Corrections Agency and the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. Again, to think about kind of local solutions for helping men and women who are coming home. So what kinds of uh, needs do we have? Are there gaps in services? Where can we partner? Uh, back in 2010, we actually released the first of its kind community reentry strategic plan for Harlem. So we actually did a needs assessment and a strategic plan. And, and so some of the items in that plan you've actually experienced today. So back then we talked about promoting the leadership of men and women who are formerly incarcerated by developing what in the plan was called a speaker's bureau. Uh, and you heard today, uh, years later, two individuals who participated in a training. So we've actually been uh, acting on those recommendations uh, with our partners, creating more partnerships and involving the faith community. Uh, you all are a kind of testament to that, uh, you know, to that. So the, the task force has been instrumental in kind of pushing some, some borough-wide, county-wide um, uh, uh, approaches to the entry and so as part of our work we you know also are partnering we have a family reentry uh, program this is targeting young men who are uh, 16 to 24 uh, I, it still really bothers me I have to tell you that I uh, sometimes would get a 16 or 17 year old person on parole uh, who was convicted um, and served time in a state youth uh, facility and then comes to us on regular parole. Yes, that does happen, and it's why Raise the Age is so important, that we move young people out of uh, the adult system. But we have always talked with parole about creating a different way of working with young adults uh, on parole. We now know that uh, their brains are very different uh, than most of us in the room. They're much more likely to take risk they, it, engagement for them is very different than it is for an adult, right? Things have to be attractive uh, uh, to young people in order to really get their attention. Um, and young people uh, also, if they're around peers who are very negative, they can be very influenced by that. And the family is often, for our young people, very important. Um, so we, our program actually works with the families before they come out. We have been piloting with parole what we are calling family orientation. I know people in this room have been to some of them. They are beautiful. We invite families to come in to the basement of a church across the street. We have a meal together. The parole officers are there. The family gets to meet the parole officers who will be working with uh, their client. Uh, children are invited to come. We talk about what parole you know, is, how it works, and, and families get a chance at the tables to uh, ask questions that they may have about parole. Um, surprisingly, uh, it may surprise you to know that families are often not consulted uh, as part of the, the parole process. Uh, parole also may visit a home to determine if it's appropriate for a person to return to, and often that's it. Um, but we know that family conflict, for example, can derail, particularly for our younger clients, can make it really hard for them to be successful, to get a job and keep a job or get back into school. Some of our young people are parents themselves, so there are a lot of family issues and family conflict issues uh, that need to be worked out. Uh, and it's part of that approach that we uh, also engage the faith community uh, as well. So. That's the, that's the kind of 30,000 uh, foot view of what we do. Um, the last thing I'll mention is that we actually conducted a randomized control trial study 
of our reentry work. Highly, uh, that's what you want to always do to know if I'm spending your money effectively uh, and if we're actually being effective on the problem. Our clients are moderate to high risk. They're 45% less likely than the control group to return to prison on a violation. They're 23% uh, less likely to recidivate and 60% less likely to commit a felony. Uh, to recidivate on a felony. We think that that, that kind of uh, success is very important for public safety in our community. Um, but the, the other side of the coin is that when we interviewed both control group and uh, our clients, our clients were more likely to be employed. They were more likely to be employed full time, more likely to, to earn a higher wage. And so we know that good reentry work is not just about preventing recidivism, it's also about preparing people to be good members of their community. So thank you.